Attendees are in listen-only mode. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this evening's webinar on nurturing your mind and body, courtesy of True Health Diagnostics. True Health Diagnostics is an innovative diagnostic company providing the most comprehensive diagnostic tests to prevent cardiovascular disease and other chronic illnesses. Uh, we empower your physicians to accurately diagnose, prevent, and manage cardiovascular disease genetic disorders, and metabolic conditions. We, tonight, we want to empower you in order to take charge of your health by nurturing your mind and body. I will be your presenter for this evening. My name is Terry Close. I'm a clinical health consultant with True Health Diagnostics. I have been working in this capacity for the past five years. I, although I have been working in the medical field for over 20 years, first starting as a nurse in the hospital and seeing the effects of disease and how it has ravaged the health of people. And I too have become passionate about preventing illness instead of just treating illness. And so it is with honor and privilege that I uh, am your presenter tonight on nurturing your mind and body. The first order of business is to make sure that you all can hear me. So if somebody would please either type in your uh, question box or in the chat box so I know that you can indeed hear me. So I want to make sure we take care of that before I proceed. There's no sense in going any further unless I know that you can hear me. Okay, I Thank you for uh, those of you who did respond to let me know. So let's go ahead and proceed then with the webinar. That is if I can get my slides to advance. There we go. Okay. So being well is not just about getting by, but about thriving. You probably know what to do already. You try to eat healthy. Uh, you no to exercise, may already be exercising, but maybe you aren't seeing the results that you hoped for. Maybe last year ended and you didn't get achieve the results you hoped to last year. Maybe you're still feeling tired and fatigued. So if you aren't seeing the benefits you hope for, you might be lacking in other key factors for your health. In order to be truly healthy, you need to have a healthy mind and a healthy body. Both your body and mind work together. They need to function together harmoniously. And when they do, they will produce synergistic effects for true health. Diet and exercise are two important factors for health, but they are simply not enough. If you address only these two factors, your mind and body will likely be out of balance and not as strong as if they were working together in harmony. For optimum health, the body and mind must be in balance. Besides diet and exercise, other factors needed for true health include sleep, relaxation, or oxygenation, or as I've listed here, deep breathing. Why do you need those? Well, they're important to combat the effects of stressors that affect our bodies every day. Even if you make healthy food choices and get regular exercise, you need these other components which are key to have true health. You probably know you need sleep, um, but you need relaxation and you definitely cannot live without oxygen, but you need optimum oxygenation and this can only be achieved with deep breathing. So to nurture your body, you must nurture your mind. If you take care of your mind, your body's going to be strong, enabling you to be tenacious against the stressors of life. So tonight I'm going to talk to you about Sleep and stress, the two important areas that can impact your health and what you can do to get better sleep and to manage the stress in your life. 
Some of the techniques that I'll be covering will be breathing, muscle relaxation, meditation, visualization, and yoga. As time permits, we're going to practice some of these techniques. If you have any questions as we go, please make sure you type your questions in either the question box or you can type them in the chat box. And I will either address those as I go or I will take the questions at the end. If you're trying to do more with less, you're not alone. Sleep deprivation seems to be the trend today. And because of that, it's going to be the first factor that I'm going to be covering. Sleep is so vital for our health and so underrated. And maybe that's why sleep is so often sacrificed in order for us to do more and to get all that seems to, uh, to do all that we need to do. Not only that, but it seems that being able to get by on a minimal amount of sleep is highly valued and regarded these days. However, sleep has so many important functions, among them being learning, memory, processing, and cellular repair. Adults need about seven to nine hours of sleep. And if you have an illness or you're trying to combat disease or repair your body, you need more than nine hours, nine and a half hours at least, and maybe even more than that. In the blue box, on the right, you'll see that the guidelines for sleep based on age according to the Sleep Foundation. The younger you are, the more sleep that is needed. All the way up to our the teenagers that may need up to 10 hours of sleep. Now these are just guidelines and there is some variation, but research seems to show that less than seven hours of sleep can result in diseases and the, the if you the less amount of sleep you get, the greater the risk you are. Our bodies are designed to need sleep. It's not just wasted time. Your body is actually working hard during sleep to repair and restore. Sleeping controls your hormonal production and an internal biological clock regulates the timing for sleep. The clock cycles in a 24-hour period called a circadian rhythm. In humans, this clock is located in the suprachiasmatic nucleus, which is located in the hypothalamus in the brain. Because the circadian rhythm is set at 24 hours, it must be reset daily. The cue that sets this biological clock with the environment is going to be light. There are photoreceptors that are in your retina, and they're going to transport this light to your suprachiasmatic nucleus. Now, during daylight, actually, the, the signals are going to be turned off. But when darkness occurs and the sun goes down, the suprachiasmatic nucleus begins to actively produce melatonin. So the suprachiasmic, oh, I'm sorry, that is incorrect. The suprachiasmic nucleus will send a signal to your pineal gland, and your pineal gland will begin to secrete the hormone melatonin. This usually occurs around 9 p.m., which for some of you, it's a, it might be that time already or getting close to that time. So you might start to becoming a little bit sleepy and to feel less alert. So if you fall asleep during this presentation, I will uh, not be offended uh, by that at all. Um, so because sleep is going to become more inviting. Now your melatonin levels in the blood will stay elevated for about 12 hours all throughout the night in, in order to help you with sleep. Um, when the night the light of a new day comes, then again the signal is going to go and it's going to turn off the production of melatonin. Now also among the many functions of melatonin is the suppression of tumor development, which is why insomnia can increase your risk of cancer. In addition, melatonin also suppresses harmful free radicals. 
Melatonin works with prolactin to signal the immune system and the metabolism to keep the fire burning so all your enzymes and metabolic pathways perform to perfection. And this is all going to be controlled by the light-dark cycles. Now, loss of sleep is going to affect at least 11 different hormones in the body, and I have only four listed here. Those being leptin, ghrelin, cortisol, and growth hormone. So with sleep deprivation, you tend to have an imbalance of these hormones. And you can see these levels uh, in your lab values. Usually, our body will secrete ghrelin to signal that we're hungry. And when, we, when our body is satisfied, it will secrete the hormone leptin. However, these are again disrupted during sleep and usually you'll have a reversal. You'll have uh, increased levels of the hormone ghrelin. And that's going to trigger you to be more hungry during the night. If you uh, are, or I'm sorry, all day long as a matter of fact, or if you stay up late, then it will make you even more hungry during the night. As far as the hormone uh, leptin goes, this slide here actually shows the leptin levels being in the high risk. And high leptin levels is not a good thing because that indicates that the brain is becoming leptin resistant and is not getting the signal to be satisfied. So sleeping and eating are vital physiological processes that are linked via a complicated network or of hormonal pathways. And losing this homeostasis is uh, one process that exerts deleterious effects uh, on the other during both the short and the long term. So again, as far as lack of sleep, there's sort of two issues at work with sleep and weight gain. And kind of the first is intuitive. If you're up late, the odds are greater that you're going to be doing some late night snacking. And usually the snacking is not going to be on healthy foods such as fruits or vegetables. Uh, it tends to be either sweets or other kinds of junk food. And then the other reason involves what's, what I've already discussed as far as what's going on uh, chemically, biochemically when you're sleep deprived. So again, these changes in your hormone level are gonna increase your hunger and your appetite. And again, they're also going to make you not feel as full after eating. So this seems to kind of coincide with the uh, increase, global increase in body mass index that is occurring with the shorter sleep cycles and so shorter sleep durations that have been occurring over recent decades. And this correlation is also seen in children and adolescents and, and the development of obesity as well. There was an interesting study done at the University of Chicago, and researchers restricted uh, 10 dieters sleep to less than six hours a night. And during this time, they lost only half the amount of fat and more muscle than when they got eight hours of sleep. So, well, why is this? Why did they um, lose more muscle? Well, part of that is, is because uh, sleep is needed for the release of growth hormone. So you might think of sleep as being, uh, I'm sorry, growth hormone as being only important in the youth to promote growth, but the growth hormone also is important as we age because the growth hormone increases our muscle mass. It also thickens our skin and strengthens our bone. So that is probably one of the mechanisms behind uh, a decrease in muscle mass. And that's going to be important because our muscle mass is our metabolic machinery, which is going to burn. So we want to make sure we preserve that. And that's going to be uh, the only way to get that is with adequate sleep. Other hormones that are affected during our sleep will affect our metabolism. So sufficient shut eye is also needed for our blood sugar or blood glucose control. So uh, when we measure the amount of sugar in the blood, the sugar that is measured is called glucose. The hormone responsible for regulating that is going to be insulin. Insulin is the hormone that opens the doors of the cell in order to let the glucose in so the cell can use the glucose for energy. 
With decreased sleep, there tends to be a reduced insulin sensitivity. This will result, result in an increase in your insulin levels and further resulting in insulin resistance. This can lead to, over time, the development of diabetes. For those who already have diabetes, this can, sleep deprivation can make it more difficult to control blood sugars. This slide summarizes the effects of sleep deprivation. Sleep deprivation greatly increases your risk of all diseases, along with greatly hindering the process of healing that occurs at night while you're in deep sleep. There is significant interaction between sleep and the immune system, and adequate restorative sleep is needed to maintain good immunity. With sleep deprivation, there will increase daytime levels of inflammatory hormones and also a change in your pro-inflammatory pathways. Lack of sleep also throws the mind off because loss of sleep affects your neurotransmitter production, especially those of dopamine and serotonin. This is directly going to affect your mental and emotional health. Not only is sleep deprivation associated with increased daytime sleepiness and fatigue, which most of us are aware of, but it also re results in reduced neurocognitive performance. In fact, sleep deprivation is also seen to be contributing to, a, to motor vehicle accidents. So a lack of sleep has detrimental effects on all aspects of your health. And chronic sleep deprivation might be linked to increased all-cause morbidity and mortality. So let's take a few minutes and pause and think about what is affecting, what is interfering most with your sleep. This might help you to decide on which strategies you might need to utilize. Now that you know how important sleep is to your health and well-being, you'll want to make sure you're getting the seven to nine hours your body needs. Just as there's good habits for eating and exercise, putting good habits into practice can help you get the sleep you need. The first tip is to make sure you're getting the right light at the right time. Since light is a powerful, in, powerful regulator of our circadian rhythms, you want to make sure for good sleep that the lights are low before bed because, again, this is going to trigger the release of the melatonin. So two to three hours before bed, you want to lower the lights. Again, the dim light signal the brain to secrete melatonin to bring on your sleep. You can use a low watt 15 volt bulb for reading until bedtime. All sources of blue light should be turned off one hour before bedtime. So this includes your cell phones, your computers, digital clocks. So uh, um, if possible, if you have a digital clock and uh, it's interfering with your secretion of melatonin, you can um, cover them up. And by all means, don't glance at that clock during the night. It will only make you concentrate even more on you not being able to sleep if you're having trouble sleeping. Since daytime light exposure is going to stop the secretion of melatonin, it's going to be very important that you get exposure to bright light within 30 minutes of waking to reset your sleep-wake cycle. 10 to 15 minutes of morning sunlight is going to send a strong message to your internal clock that day has arrived, making it less likely to be confused by weaker light signals uh, that are sent during the night. Also, if you work indoors, which many of us do, and many of us may even be working indoors where we don't have windows to see outside, you want to make it a point to get outdoors for at least a total of 30 to 60 minutes during the brightest portion of your day. 
The last point is to make sure to, or to install low wattage yellow, orange, or red light bulbs if you need a source of light for navigation at night. So light in these bandwidths does not shut down melatonin production in the way that white and blue bandwidth light does. Salt lamps are handy for this purpose. During the day, you want to make the most of your day by getting exercise. Don't sleep your day away. Exercise can help you fall asleep quicker, sleep better and longer, and gives you a better quality of sleep. A small handful of studies even show that exercise is effective in improving the sleep of people with insomnia. In addition, exercise has stress-busting benefits. It pumps up your endorphins, which are your feel-good neurotransmitters. Regular exercise also improve your, improves your mood. It can increase your self-confidence and lower your symptoms associated with mild depression and anxiety. The American Heart Association recommends 150 minutes of moderately intense activity per, per week for the general population. If you find you need a daytime nap or want to nap, make sure you limit your naps. Getting enough sleep on a regular basis is the best way to feel alert and feel your best during the day. While naps do not necessarily make up for inadequate or poor quality sleep, a short nap of 20 to 30 minutes can help improve your mood alertness and performance. Now, it's important that you know that, uh, that a temporary lull in your alertness that occurs in the afternoon is entirely normal. This is known as the post-lunch dip. A lot of people contribute this to their lunch and what they eat at lunch. And indeed, if you eat a big lunch or a high carbohydrate lunch, it, it's likely to make this post-lunch dip even worse. But this post-lunch dip is a function of your circadian rhythm. So it is naturally to feel tired um, around 2 o'clock in the afternoon. So if fatigue sets in, a quick nap can do wonders for your mental and physical stamina, but do keep it short. 10 minutes can be enough. Longer than 30 minutes or napping too late in the day can interfere with your falling asleep and your nighttime sleep quality. Now, I don't know if I have any uh, night shift workers listening, but if you are, uh, taking a nap before you go into work can uh, be beneficial for you. In order to have better quality sleep, you also want to consider what beverages you are drinking. You want to avoid coffee, tea, colas, and, and energy drinks with caffeine. And there's lots of energy drinks with caffeine these days. So if you're not sure, make sure that you check the labels. Caffeine blocks the hormones that will make you sleep. And the effects of caffeine can last for several hours. Even chocolate has caffeine, so it's best not consumed in the evening. You might want to consider limiting all your fluids for several hours before bed. So this way you're not, have, you're not waking up during the night to have to make trips to the bathroom. And think twice before consuming alcohol as a sleep aid. Alcohol is not a good sleep aid. And although alcohol can help you fall asleep, it can actually disrupt your sleep over the course of the night. Alcohol causes restless sleep and waking during the night. And because of that, it can interfere with your quality of sleep. In addition, alcohol actually keeps you from entering the deeper stages of sleep, which is when healing occurs. Because of this, this can cause you to wake up still feeling tired despite having spent an adequate amount of time in bed. Anyone who has children knows the importance of a bedtime routine, but we've all been children at one time, and hopefully you had a bedtime routine when you were a child, but maybe you've lost that as, in, as you've become an adult. 
but a bedtime routine is just as important to us as adults. As adults, we also need a winding down period before bed. It also tells our body it's time to relax and prepare to go to sleep. It's usually best to start at least an hour before bed, but if you don't currently have a bedtime routine, start with one about 10 minutes before your sleep. It can vary from person to person, but you might want to maybe start your bedtime routine with making it a to-do list for the next day. So this way, you're not bothered during the night with what you have to do for the next day. Your bedtime might include listening to music, reading, again, if you do, use that low wattage bowl, or taking a bath. And here we have a, a recipe for a, a aromatherapy bath which uses lavender, and lavender oils can lower your cortisol levels, which I'll discuss even in more detail as far as being a stress hormone. But you can also use lavender oil in a diffuser or even apply it topically. It's very important also that you are consistent with the times you go to bed and the times you wake up. Going to bed and waking at the same time helps also set your biological clock. And by all means, if you notice that uh, what you're watching before bedtime, uh, such as the news, agitates you, uh, then you want to avoid those things. And it, it's also probably important to avoid anything else that is upsetting before bedtime. The last tip is going to be to make sure you have a bedroom that is conducive to sleep. And in order for that to happen, you have to use your bedroom for its intended purpose. You need to make sure your bedroom is a place of rest, relaxation, and serenity. It's not a place to do work. It's not a place to watch TV, or work on your computer, or to manage your finances. So from now on, try to make your bedroom a no-work zone. Also, try and have good pillows. If you wake tired with a stiff neck, it might be your pillow. Pillows that are too flat um, or too fat can cause problems. So your pillow should be just the right size to support your neck in a neutral position. For, slot, for side sleepers, your nose should align with the center of your body. Stomachs. Sleeping on your stomach twists your neck and is best avoided. Now, uh, you, if you sleep on your side, you might want to consider putting a pillow between your legs. Uh, this can help align your hips and re reduce the stress on your back. And this would be important, especially if you have problems with low back pain. If you're a back sleeper and you're troubled with low back pain, you might want to tuck a pillow under your knees. Make sure you neutralize the noise in your room. And by this, I mean those annoying noises that can disturb you and wake you up during the night or maybe even cause difficulty falling asleep. And we all vary in what kind of noises are annoying and disturbing to us. For some, having a, some soothing white noise can cover up some noises during the night. And if that helps you, you can try using a fan, an air conditioner, and there's even white noise generators available in stores. If necessary, you might even want to consider uh, using earplugs. You might love your pets, but they're not, but having them in bed with you is not the best thing. But it can uh, prevent you from settling into a deep sleep that your body craves. Also, pets can blink, bring fleas, fur, dander, and pollen to your bed. And these can wreak havoc with your sleep and cause uh, sleep wrecking allergies. It's also important to keep the temperature in your room no higher than 70 degrees, ideally usually between 60 and 68 degrees. Keeping your room too cool or too hot can lead to restless sleep. When you sleep, your body's internal temperature actually drops to its lowest levels. Uh, generally about four hours after you fall asleep. 
Scientists believe that a cooler room may therefore be most conducive to sleep since it mimics your body's natural temperature drop. You'll also want to make sure you keep your room dark. Use window shades, curtains, or consider a set of eye shades uh, if you cannot uh, use these other techniques. And this is very important too uh, during the summer months when the sun begins to rise very early in the morning. Uh, or even if you are a night shift worker, then you want to really make sure that you have to keep your room dark during the day so you can hopefully get some melatonin production going. So sleep and stress are interrelated. Now, inadequate sleep activates the stress response and high degrees of stress can interfere with sleep. So with the next half of my webinar, I'm going to address the problems of stress and strategies to manage your stress so you can be in control of your stress. Now it's natural for our body to respond to stress. We have a mechanism in place for our body to respond to danger. Uh, and this response is needed so it prepares our bodies for action or to fight or flight as this response is sometimes referred to. In this response, an alarm goes off in our hypothalamus and it allows our glands to release hormones for our bodies, again, to fight or flight or take action. One of these hormones is going to be adrenaline. Now, adrenaline is going to increase your heart rate, elevate your blood pressure, and boost your energy supplies. That other hormone that I've already talked to is cortisol. Cortisol is your body's primary stress hormone. And in a time of stress uh, or or in danger, it's very important. It serves us very well because it's going to increase the sugars to your bloodstream, enhances your brain's use of glucose, and increases the availability of some of other substances that are going to be necessary. So in a time of stress or danger, uh, again, cortisol is very important. Uh, it's going to, though, shut off your immune system and suppress the digestive system, reproductive system and growth processes because these are not going to be needed during a time of, of danger and a time when you need to take quick action. So if you're being chased by a wild animal, you need to save your child from danger. There is a, a fire, a tornado, then your stress response will enable your body to act. Unfortunately, not many of us are being chased by wild animals these days. Um, instead, we're faced with other types of stress. We might have job problems, financial difficulties, or relationship dilemmas. Yet, depending on how we perceive these threats depends on how our body responds. Our body may still be releasing the same stress hormones. So we need to be alert to the signs and symptoms that this may produce in our body so we are aware when we're under undue stress. If you're constantly under stress, your body is going to continue to release these same chemicals as the fight or flight response. And these uh, chemicals will stay on, continue to be released, putting you at, at risk for a state of disease, which can result in dis disease. Now, the effects of stress can be seen in your lab values, and these can serve as early warning before disease develops. The first ones that are shown here are your atherogenic or your bad lipid particles. Uh, the ABOB gives us you a measure of B, all your bad particles, and two of those being your LDL particles or low density lipoproteins and the small low-density lipoprotein particles. If these atherogenic particles in your blood are high, it increases your risk for developing atherosclerosis and heart, and, and heart disease. So when you're reviewing your labs, you'll want to consider uh, which stresses you're under and if it could be contributing to your levels being elevated. And then if 
some stress management might be indicated to help lower your risk. Stress can also damage the arteries through inflammation, and this can increase the likelihood of those bad particles accumulating inside of the arteries. Your doctor can look at these values and see if any extra attention needs to be paid to other indicators as well, such as better diabetes control, hypertension control, lipid management, or sleep apnea management. The long-term activation of this stress response system and the overexposure to cortisol and your other stress hormones can disrupt almost all your body's processes. This puts you at increased risk for numerous health problems. So as you can see here again, all, all the different systems of your body can be affected and listed next to them are all the dis different types of diseases that can occur. So the diseases can occur because of the increased, the increased secretion of cortisol turning on certain responses or curbing other functions that are, are going to be non-essential or detrimental in the flight or fight situation, which I've already mentioned. So it alters the immune system response and suppresses the digestive system, reproductive system, and the growth processes. So what do we do about the stress that we have to deal with day in and day out so that it doesn't result in disease? There's lots of different relaxation techniques that, that you can use in order for you to take control over your stress. The first one is making sure you get adequate oxygenation through breathing. The simplest breathing technique is called even breathing. In order to do even breathing, you're going to pinch the skin underneath your nose between your nostrils. As you do this, you're going to be able to feel cool air going in and you'll feel the warm air going out. As you're breathing and you feel the cool air going in, you can visualize and imagine clean energy going into your body. And when you feel the warm air going out, you can visualize the release of toxins. So go ahead and take a minute and feel that cool air going in and out. To take this a step further, you might want to try alternate nostril breathing. Alternate nostril breathing produces optimum function to both sides of the brain, the creativity side and the logical verbal side. It creates a more balanced person since both half of the brain are functioning properly. To do alternate nasal breathing, I first want to uh, tell you how you need to position your hands. There's two different ways you can do this, but you're going to use your thumb to hold one nostril and your ring and your pinky finger to hold the other. And you can use your left hand or your right hand. Um, if you're right-handed, it's probably easiest for you to use your right hand. If you're left-handed, again, go ahead and use your left hand. So you're going to use your thumb and place that against one of your nostrils. And you're going to use your other two fingers against uh, the other side. Now you have your index finger and your middle finger. And this is what can vary. You can either position them upward and against the bridge of your nose, or you can position them down underneath your nostrils. And you might want to experiment to find which technique that you like better. So before we put it all together, how this is going to work is with alternate nasal breathing, you're always going to breathe in the nostril you breathe out with. So to start with, if you would breathe in through your right nostril, you're going to breathe out through the left. Then you're going to breathe back in through the left and breathe out through the right. Now, so let's go ahead and see if you can put that together. So again, put one 
your thumb against one nostril against and your uh your ring i'm sorry your uh yeah your ring finger and your pinky finger against the other go ahead and press against your with your thumb and I'm, I'm going to assume that I have right-handed people. It's going to be hard for me to address both. So let's just say you're going to occlude your nostril uh, and breathe in through your left. It will be through your left. You're going to hold with both, hold and occlude both nostrils, release your thumb, blow out through your right, breathe back in through your right, occlude, on. Release your your left nostrils and breathe back out. Breathe back in through your left. Whew, that's kind of complicated to go ahead and explain, um, but hopefully with practice you will get that. Another technique is just using deep breathing, um, deep diaphragmatic breathing to help again you to increase your lung capacity so you can take in more than the teacup of air and increase your capacity to over a quart of air. And this is important too because uh, with tension and stress, we tend to breathe more shallowly. And also a lot of times uh, with jobs that we have, we might be leaning over and it also does cut back on our lung capacity as well. Uh, increase oxygen. Uh, we breathe gives us more physical energy. It's going to improve your concentration and your mental clarity. And this is important because it's one of the first things we lose under stress. It also is going to help eliminate your toxins as you breathe. This is the positions that you can use for diaphragmatic breathing. You can either do it sitting up or you can do it laying down. I think it's easier to learn laying down because it's going to help you keep your chest still. So in this technique, you're going to position one hand over your chest and the second hand is going to be over your belly. And during this, you're going to try and keep the hand against your chest as still as possible. And you're going to force yourself to breathe using your abdomen, which is going to allow you to, to pull your diaphragm down in order to get a deeper breath and more air into your lungs. This is going to show you this, uh, tell you the steps. So again, if you want to practice this, go ahead and get yourself in a comfortable position. Put that one hand on your chest, put that other hand on your abdomen below your rib cage. You're going to go ahead and breathe in slowly through your nose, keeping that hand on your chest as still as possible. Then when it's time to breathe out, tighten your belly muscles and let them fall inward as you exhale. So you would go ahead and repeat this. Again, breathing out, go ahead and get that, that hand on your abdomen or your belly should go out, hold it, and then you'll want to exhale, letting your belly fall. So now let's see, um, we, we're doing pretty good on our time, so why don't you go ahead and pick a technique that you might want to use. Uh, I want to give you just a few more pointers too that might help you take some deep breaths in order to help you to expand your lung capacity even more. You might also want to roll your shoulders back and that can be something that would be easy for you to do if you're at your desk. The other thing you can do is also as you're breathing in and out, you can allow your arms to rise up and that will help you to maybe even visualize the air going in and then lower them as you breathe out. So I'm gonna scroll up, uh, scroll back to this um, alternate nasal breathing for those of you in case you want to use this technique again so you can see it because I think it's maybe one of the more difficult ones and so you, you can uh, picture it. So let's go ahead and try this. Again, um, get ready and you're going to take a deep breath in. One, two, three, four. 
Hold it. One, two, three, four. Breathe out. Two, three, four. Breathe back in. Two, three, four. Hold. Two, three, four. And out. Two, three, four. Using deep breathing will also help lower your blood pressure and your heart rate. Your relaxation can be further enhanced and your stress reduced even more by using progressive muscle relaxation. You probably know that when you're stressed, your muscles become tense. Each of us will be different in which muscle groups become tense when we're under stress. So using these techniques will not only help us to become aware of which muscle groups are tense, it'll help us to become to know what to do in order to help relax those muscles. In this diagram here, it again shows you doing this technique sitting on a chair, which again, if you're in your workplace, is probably where you're going to need to be doing it. However, when you're at home, I think it would be best for you to practice maybe laying down. But you'll want to start wherever you are at by getting in a comfortable position. And you're going to be uh, tensing your groups, your muscle groups, and then relaxing them. Again, this allows you to feel the difference between tension and relaxation. So, again, in this diagram, it demonstrates starting up at your head and working downwards, which I like to use this technique because it allows me to visualize the tension going out flowing out and down out of my body. I've also seen it done where you start with your feet and work your way up to your head, but it doesn't matter, whichever one works best for you. So let's go ahead and try this technique. I want you to really scrunch up your face, kind of like you're frowning, squeeze your eyes tight, ooh, clench your jaws all together. Okay, now that you feel the tension, go ahead and relax. Let your eyes, uh, your eyelids blink. Let your jaw relax. Now let's move on. I'm going to go to, the, to diagram number four because I want to, again, work our way downward. So take your shoulders, tense them up. Let your shoulders reach all the way up to your earlobes and tighten, tighten up as much as you can. Now go ahead and relax. Let them droop down. Bring them back down and relax. Now let's go back up to number three to your arms. Uh, stick your arms out in front of you and, and tense them up. Also go ahead and tighten your fists. Clench your fists really hard as hard as you, as hard as you can. Now go ahead and relax them. Open up your fists. Let your arms hang loosely by your side. Pretend you're a rag doll and just let them hang. Let's move on to number five, to your legs. Go ahead and, and bring them up. Point your toes uh, towards your head. Tighten up the, your calf muscles. Tighten up your thigh muscles. Now go ahead and relax them. Let your feet fall back down. Let your legs hang back down to the floor. Go ahead now and take a deep breath in to the count of four. One, two, three, four. And go ahead and blow out. One, two, three, four. So you'll also want to, you can combine this technique while you're doing your deep breathing. Another technique to try is meditation. Meditation is important because we have 50,000 to 70,000 thoughts per day, which means you have 35 to 48 opportunities every minute to fill your mind with positive affirming thoughts. But if thoughts are racing through our head, it can be difficult to get our muscles to relax. So you, to maximize the effectiveness of deep breathing and muscle relaxation, you might want to add meditation. Meditation can reduce stress and pro promote relaxation by helping you manage your thoughts. 
It does this by increasing your awareness of the present moment and eliminating distractions. In meditation, you take control over those thoughts. You can focus on a sound, an object, an image, a breath, or a movement. You might want to consider yoga. Yoga has been shown to alleviate many medical problems, which are uh, shown on this slide. Yoga can be done based on your ability. So no matter where you are at in your level of fitness, or no matter what kind of condition, medical condition you have, yoga can be adapted to you. Most of the times, yoga instructors will give you modifications based on your limitation. It's not competitive. You can do it at your own ability. Yoga will combine a lot of the techniques that I talked about. Uh, it allows you to do deep breathing, and a lot of the poses that are done reduce anxiety and help relieve muscle tension. Visualization is the final technique that I'll be talking about. Visualization uh, is an effective way to relax your mind and body by picturing a relaxing scene. So depending on what you like will depend on which scene you're going to is going to be relaxing to you. For the scene I'm showing here is a beach scene, and that is relaxing for some, but it could be another peaceful place. Maybe you're a mountain person, you want to visualize a mountain scene. Maybe a garden, a meadow, maybe even uh, something that you enjoy, such as fishing, is so relaxing to you that that will be where you want to, to have your, your image. I'm going to take you through a visualization uh, using the scene that I have here. So when you do visualization, you want to try and engage as many of your senses as possible. So in your, first of all, your eyes, try and make the image as vivid as possible. What kind of things are you seeing? So again, in this image, we see the ocean, palm trees, a, a beautiful blue sky, the beautiful blue water. What are you hearing? Probably on the beach, you're going to be hearing the waves. Uh, you might hear the breeze, you might hear uh, seagulls as well. What are you feeling? Probably you feel the sand. You might feel the cool water on your feet. Maybe you're, you're feeling, um, again, the breeze blowing against your face. What kind of things are you smelling? Do you smell the salt water? Do you smell the sunscreen? The more you can engage your senses, the more your visualization will be, become real to you and the more that you will be able to relax and reduce your stress. This can help you to control your blood pressure, boost your immune system, lower your cholesterol, lower blood sugar levels, and it controls your heart rate. Another benefit to, to visualization is that it can be done virtually anywhere and anytime. So even though you can't go on vacation, you can always take a mental vacation. So in order to have a strong and healthy body and be totally healthy, you want to nourish your mind. You want to make sure that you're getting the adequate sleep that your body needs in order to heal, and in order to do that, you'll want to make sure that you get adequate sleep by getting seven to nine hours of sleep a night. Get the sleep you need by making sure you have a bedtime routine and have a bedroom that's conducive to sleep. Utilize these deep breathing, relaxation techniques, incorporating meditation and yoga so that your body will be able to withstand the effects of stress.
As Benjamin Franklin says, early to bed, early to rise makes a man healthy, wealthy, and wise. If anybody has any questions, you can go ahead and type them in now if you already haven't. I see that I have um, somebody would like a copy of the slides. And so we I do have um, your email addresses, so I can go ahead and send copies of the slides so you can have those breathing techniques. Yes, I, I'm sure those would be very helpful to you to have both, to see those again. And I, that'll be great so that you can practice them. And again, the more you practice those techniques, the more second nature they will be to you. So when you encounter a stressful situation, you will naturally uh, go to those techniques. I'm trying to get my slides to advance here, which they're not advancing, but we're near the end. I wanted to get my email address for you. Let's see if we can, ah, there we go. Um, first of all, if you would like to have an individual consultation, uh, you can call our, call this number and schedule an individual appointment uh, that can, that they may help you to develop these techniques even further or also, um, help you to prioritize and decide where you want to start and what will work best for you. Also help you to uh, evaluate and understand your lab values. So if when I send the slides, yes, you can also uh, have these references as well. There will be a, these list of references will be included for you. And if you want to contact me for uh, for, for other questions or information, my email is tclose at truehealthdiag.com. Um, so I'll be available to you as well through, the, through email. But again, you can also call and make an individual appointment with a clinical health consultant as well. Uh, make sure that you also get the schedule for all the upcoming webinars. We have webinars every month. If you cannot, if you're interested in a webinar and you cannot attend when it's being presented, then they are recorded and you can go back and listen to them at your convenience. So we are, I, that takes us to the end of our presentation. I thank you for joining us tonight. It's the end of our night for a lot of you. It is going to be bedtime. I hope that you are. Uh, are a little bit more relaxed and you are ready to go to bed. Maybe some of you still have a few hours left uh, to your evening, but uh, for whatever you have to do for the rest of the evening, I hope it will be a peaceful and relaxing one. Uh, we still, I still have a few minutes left uh, on the webinar, so I will stay until uh, eight o'clock. So if anybody else has any questions, I will go ahead and take those questions. Um, otherwise, we look forward to hearing from you in maybe uh, a future webinar.